Okay, this sermon's entitled, Why We Should Believe the Bible, or Reasons to Believe the Bible. Let's open up with prayer, then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's open up with Psalm 119, the first three verses. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Now, this sermon's for people that are skeptics, doubters, atheists, agnostics, in another religion, you know, and you just don't believe the Bible. Well, I'm going to give you some solid reasons why we should believe the Bible, and why the Bible is trustworthy. And I'd like to start off with, number one, it claims to be the truth. And see, there has to be the truth out there, and truth is exclusive. And the Bible claims to be the truth, so if there is truth, it has to have a source. Any, anyone who's a truth seeker will find, find the source of truth, and the source of truth is the Bible. John 17:17 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So that's number one. It's the truth. That's why we should we should re, we should believe it. Number two, it gives hope. Now you can read a lot of other sacred texts, so-called you know other religious books out there, but do they really give hope? The Bible talks about hope in Titus chapter one. It says, "In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began." So number three, we are sinners, and the Bible describes you know sin. And we can't deny that we're sinners because everyone is a sinner. So turn to First John chapter three. First John chapter three. It says in verse four, "Whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law." So we need to understand that we are sinners, and the only hope is Jesus Christ, who is the central theme of the, of the whole Bible. It's the character of, of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins. He took care of he took our sins on himself so that we don't have to be punished for our sins. And that's why the Bible needs to be believed because it's reliable in that no other religion or no other religious text has a savior that actually took upon himself our sins and was a scapegoat for our sins. So we see that the Bible offers this, and if you just read the next verse, it says and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him Christ is no sin. So that's another reason why we should believe the Bible. It offers hope. Okay, The message of the, of the plan of salvation is, is a supernatural mes- message. It's not something man could have come up with. Man is too inherently prideful to come up with this message. Salvation, according to the Bible, is, is a gift by grace. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, the next reason is, nobody can prove that God is not real. And see, what these skeptics are doing is they're trying to say that, well, we don't see God. So how can we know he's real? Well, of course you don't see God. The Bible says that God is invisible. Let's go ahead and turn to that verse. So that that's why you don't see God, is because he's invisible. But that proves he's real because we don't see him. So it says in First Timothy chapter 1, Look at verse 17, it says, Now unto the, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's why you don't see God. He's invisible. Okay? Now, number six, creationism. How did we get here? Genesis chapter 1 talks about how we got here. If you don't adhere to, to the Bible account of creation or creationism found in, in, in the book of Genesis and throughout the whole you know canon of Scripture, then you have to basically relegate to some other system. And unfortunately, all the world has to offer are, are moot systems. For instance, have ex nihilo. It means out of nothing. And that would basically also uh, refer to autogenesis or abiogenesis. That's the idea that life came from non-life. Or, or life came from nothing. And, you know, a state of nolibicity could bring upon life. It makes no sense. So, you, the Bible tells us how we got here, and it gives us a very plausible, you know, logical, uh, you know, means. You know, God is the creator. So, we have to understand that we have to, at, based on the law of causality, it posits that is, if there is an effect, there must be a cause. 
God is the cause, human existence is the effect. And if you're an atheist, all you have is the effect, you don't have any cause. But logically, we have to have a cause and an effect, and in Christianity, we do have the cause and the effect. Like I said, God, the creator, is the cause, and life as we know it is the effect. So, basically, that's another reason why we should believe the Bible, because it explains all this. Now, the next reason is, because the Bible is the only worldview that gives a sinner absolute assurance of their salvation. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Salvation is based on the grace of God, and therefore we, we, we have assurance. You can't get assurance in other religions, trying to work your way to heaven, trying to climb some you know, meritorious ladder, trying to, to, to work your way towards God. No, you can't do it. But that's why in Christianity, God sent Jesus Christ down to us to save us. We don't work our way to him. He, he, came, he came down to meet us, and he saves us completely by his grace. And that's what the, that's the, that the whole story of, the, of the, the gospel's all about. He died on the cross, he was buried, and then he rose again. And another thing is that event is historically proven as, 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 as true. And if you do some research on it, you'll find that out. And we have extra biblical testimonies to back this up as well. And I've already done a sermon on that. So my, my point is, if you go to other types of so-called sacred texts, like for instance the, the Quran, they have contradictions. Contradictions are so absurd, and they would do so much to damage the credibility of, of the book, that I don't even know why anyone would even bother with this. I mean, the Bible is comprised of 66 books, and there's not one single contradiction in it. But the Quran, which is comprised of what they call surahs, contradicts itself left and right. Like, they can't even decide if man was created from congealed blood or sounding clay or from the dust or even nothing at all. In fact, it states all four. So which one is it? So it's, it's unreliable. It's not trustworthy. Whereas the Bible is trustworthy. The next thing on the list is the Bible is has been here the longest. John 1.1. 1, 1. Let's go ahead and turn there. And people are, will, will say that there are other religions that predated Christianity. It's just not true. There may have been false religions that predated it, you know, paganism and whatnot. And all different, there's all different types of, you know, religions that may, may have been around con, in concomitance with, the, with Christianity. But Christianity has always been here. Number one, the Bible claims, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So that tells you that Christianity was always here. Okay? Now, so it, that tells you it's trustworthy because it's been here forever. Okay? With God, there is no time. Okay? God is everlasting. Okay? Jesus Christ is without origin. So we see that um, the Bible has been here the longest. Okay? The God of the Bible is a lawgiver and a loving, holy God. And that's why you can trust the God of the Bible, because he is a God of love. First John 4 talks about, we love him because he first loved us. It says in, in there two, place, two different places, God is love. And then, of course, we see John 3.16 and Romans 5.8, they talk, talk about the, the love of God. So we can trust the God of the Bible, because it's a, he's a God of love. Okay, The Bible actually changes people. It has a supernatural way of affecting our lives. And you can't refute the fact that prayers are answered. And I'm not saying every prayer is answered, but you know prayers do get answered in the Christian faith. And in Psalm 119, it says, this proves that the Bible has a powerful effect. It changes people. Psalm 119, let me find the verse. Verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. That tells you that it's God's word that will change a person and cleanse their way. And no other book can claim that. But God's word does because God's word is alive. It's quick and, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. So the Bible changes uh, people. Christians have a purpose in their life. Atheists don't have an objective purpose in their life. And they may think they have a purpose, but it's not based on anything divine. As Christians, we have a purpose. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us to preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible tells us you know, to preach sermons. The Bible tells us to, you know, we should be worshiping God and praising God. And the Bible gives us lots of things to do. So we have a purpose in life, okay? Now, the thirteenth reason is the Bible is still here. Now this proves that, that it's trustworthy and reliable and voracious. Because if it were not, it wouldn't still be here. 
with all the people trying to, all the unsaved, ungodly, wicked, you know, philosophers out there that are atheistic and secular, they, they've been tried to get rid of the Bible. And yet it's still here. That tells you that there's a supernatural power behind this. It says in verse 25 of 1 Peter chapter 1, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So it's still here, and it's always going to be here. So that's an important thing to note, is that the Bible is still here. It was written over a 1600 year period by 40 different authors or writers, and they all agreed. They all concurred in, in what they were writing about. Salvation by grace. You know, heaven and hell. Jesus Christ is the, is the only Savior. So that's a, a supernatural feat in and of itself. Next thing on the list is Bible prophecy. You know, the Bible has prophesied and predicted lots of, of things that would come to pass, and a lot of them have already come to pass, and some are, are still yet in the future. But the, that fact alone tells you that it's a supernatural book. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the... Um, I'm not going to go to the exact verses... But let me just go ahead and, and name some of the, pro the prophetic events that were prophesied in the Old Testament and then they came to pass in the New Testament. Let's we'll start off with um, Jesus Christ was born in, prophesied to be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah chapter 5. And then, I'll, and then you see where it's, it's fulfilled in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, you know, 5, and then 7. Then, of course, we have in Daniel chapter 9, the time of his birth. And then in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, we see that the prophecy came to pass. Then we have, you know, the virgin birth in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and then in Luke chapter 1, verses you know, 26 to 31, it's where the event actually took place. The slaughter of the innocents in Jeremiah 31, and then in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16, it talks about, you know, Herod and, and whatnot, um, being the, uh, the, the murderer. Well, all this was, was predicted, and all of it came to pass. Um... Even in Psalm 2, he, Jesus Christ was declared the Son of God. And then that was, you know, fulfilled in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. The Galilean ministry, Isaiah chapter 9, and then that was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus Christ was to heal the brokenhearted, Isaiah chapter 61, and that was fulfilled in Luke chapter 18 where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set liberty, or to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So all these different events, and I can go on, you know, all these events were prophesied, and they came to pass. Even the fact that he was going to be spat upon and smitten was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 50. And then it was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 26, verse 67. So we can take the Bible literally because it's because all these different things took place. And there's no way to sit there and make stuff like this up. So many hundreds of years before it before the, the transpiration. So the Bible is trustworthy, and the final reason is because number one, if you don't believe the Bible, and ultimately if you don't believe the gospel and Jesus Christ on if you don't believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, you're going to end up in hell. And that's going to be a horrible fate. So let's take a look at a few verses that talk about that. Matthew chapter 25. There are, lots, there are a lot of reasons to believe the Bible. I mean, I'm just giving you kind of... I mean, I basically comprised a list of 20 different reasons. But I could, I could go all day with this. But my point is, there's no reason not to believe the Bible. You know, all these idiots out there, these skeptics that say, I don't believe the Bible, then what the... Then wh why is it here? Okay, why does it have, why does it say all this stuff? What is all this stuff just made up? You know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is that just a lie? No, it's not a lie. It's the truth. And anyone who's, you know, anyone who's logical, and anyone who who is in reality knows that. So Matthew chapter twenty-five makes it clear, verse forty-six: and these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So obviously, there's there's eternity out there. And that's the main reason, is you cannot prove that there's no eternity. Because you would have to be inside of eternity, or on the other side you know, of eternity, to be able to verify if it's real or not. And you can't do that, so you can't prove it. You can't disprove it either. So I'm just taking God at his word. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And then whenever I leave this, whenever all Christians leave this body, they will be in a glorified state in heaven forever. And there's nothing to lose with, with believing this. 
Even if it's not true, we still have nothing to lose. So, there's no reason to reject the Bible. Because the Bible claims to be God's word. The Bible claims to be the truth, the source of truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, the way and the life. And there's no reason to reject it. Because if think about it. If, if, if you reject this and it's all wrong, what do you get? You get nothing. If you reject it and it's right, you go to hell and you burn forever. Pascal's wager. And that, that's a good way to look at it. So there is no reason to reject the Bible. So let me lay out the gospel very clearly. If a person is not saved, you need to get saved immediately. And you can get saved at any point. Okay? The Bible makes it very clear that there is a hell. And hell is a place of punishment, as we just read. And if, you're not, if you go your entire life without getting saved, you will not go to heaven. You'll go to hell. And that's why the Bible says you must be born again. You get born again by believing on Jesus Christ as, as the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ died, he was buried, he rose again, and eternal life is a gift. 1 John 5, 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And then in John three sixteen, it makes it clear, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that's the main reason right there why we should believe the Bible. It's because it's all about what God has done for us. He didn't have to do this for us, but because he loved us, he gave us a way to have eternal life as a gift and to avoid hell completely. And that's the main reason why we should respond to the Bible, because it's, it's, it's basically just a love letter telling sinners how they can be saved. That's pretty much what the whole point of it is. It's really quite astonishing why people would sit there and want to argue and debate whether this is real or not, whether this is true or not, when this is not up for debate. The Bible is God's word, and the Bible is, all, like I said, it's all about what God has done for us, offering us eternal life as a gift. Why even debate that? Why not just take the Bible at its word and take God up on his offer and believe on Christ and be saved and be done with it, and then move on. Okay, there's no sense in debating this. It's like somebody finding a million dollars on the ground, and then people want to debate whether it's counterfeit or real. Look, why don't you just take it and, and then get the benefits of it? Same thing with the Bible. Take God, take God at his word. Believe on Jesus Christ, receive eternal life, and then you'll be saved forever, and, and then and God has offered us all sorts of other things as well, all, all sorts of spiritual blessings. So we need to look at the Bible as not something to be debated, but something to be received and something you know that we, we, we should be thankful for because the Bible is good news. And the bad news is that there's a hell. The good news is, is that anyone who believes on Jesus Christ should not perish but have eternal life. So that's why we need to read, read and believe the Bible because of what it offers. No other book, no other religious text, no other religion offers this. And if they do offer it, they can't deliver. The Bible delivers. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. So these are some of the reasons why we should believe the Bible. That brings me to my last two reasons. Number one, everyone alive, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a believer in Christ or if you're an atheist or a skeptic or a Satanist or a Buddhist, or a Muslim, or a whatever. I don't care who you are. Everyone alive is going to eventually know that God is exactly who he said he is, and that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Everyone's going to know this. And it says right here in Philippians chapter 2, it says in verse 10, it says that the name of, of Jesus, every, excuse me, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That says everyone alive is going to be confessing that someday. And if you you may say, I don't believe this. Well, find out, because you're going to be confessing it just the same. That's why it's important to be saved, Then, because if you're saved, then Jesus Jesus Christ is your Savior, and God is the Father. So that's another reason. It's, it's inevi inevitability tells us that we should believe this because you're going to you're going to eventually live this verse out. And of course, the final reason is because God said so. That's the only reason I need. God said this is His word, and He said that this word is truth. And if He said it, then we should just believe it. And I'll leave it at that. That's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.